assistance programs to victims and discourage identity theft. Uh, and without objection, the chair and ranking member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Uh, the, the purpose of today's hearing is to examine actions uh, the federal government has taken to address the problem of identity theft and how to provide protection to victims. We will consider many important topics today, including current and emerging issues on identity theft, how to improve both public and private assistance efforts to victims of identity theft, uh, and how to increase prosecution and deterrence of identity thieves. According to recent studies, identity theft affected nearly 10 million Americans in 2008 alone, uh, an increase of 22 percent from 2007. It is estimated that the average cost to consumers and businesses top $49 billion. Uh, identity theft is now the number one consumer complaint received by the Federal Trade Commission, accounting for 26 percent of all complaints received from consumers in 2008. Identity theft is not a victimless crime. There are many victims of identity theft, and commonly the same victim is targeted over and over again. Uh, victims include 18-month-old children, deceased loved ones, banks, insurance companies, small businesses, and the federal government, women, Hispanic Americans, military personnel, and Medicare recipients are all most likely to be victims of identity theft. Secondary and tertiary uh, victims of identity theft include families, employers, and financial institutions. Identity theft itself includes not only financial losses, but also non-financial identity theft, such as criminal and medical identity theft, uh, the identity thief uses the victim's identity co to commit a crime or to receive free medical services. Many times it is difficult for the victim to expunge their criminal and medical records from incorrect information, leading to false arrests or wrong diagnosis. Uh, experts agree that identity theft prevention and assistance efforts are lagging far behind the needs of the victims. All identity crime victims today run into a vast number of problems when trying to restore their identity. And identity thieves are quick to overcome any obstacles set in place by legislation. Today, this subcommittee will focus on these concerns voiced by the public in a collaboration to combat and prevent identity theft. I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. Uh, and now we will proceed. Um, we will proceed with swearing in the witnesses. Uh, let me start first by introducing our first panel. Uh, we will hear first from Ms. Betsy Broder, uh, an assistant director in the Division of Privacy and Identity uh, Protection for the Federal Trade Commission. In this capacity, she helps coordinate the agency's law enforcement, research, and outreach efforts on privacy issues, including the theft, uh, pretexting, and security. Next, we will hear from Mr. Jason Weinstein, uh, who currently serves as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the, in the Department of Justice's Criminal Division. Prior to working at the Department of Justice, he was an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, where he prosecuted criminal cases 
involving violent crime, gangs, public corruption, and financial crimes. And welcome to you. Our last witness on the first panel is Mr. Dan Bertoni, a director with GAO's Education, Workforce, and Income Security Team. Mr. Bertoni began his career with GAO in 1989, and over the course of his career, he has focused on identifying and preventing fraud, waste, and abuse in federal programs and has also developed a body of work related to identity theft. And thank you all for appearing uh, before the subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Oversight uh, Committee to swear in all witnesses. Before they testify, I'd like to ask each witness to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah. And let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. And each of you will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Your complete written testimony will be included in the hearing record. Uh, the yellow light in front of you will um, indicate that it is time to sum up. Uh, the red light will indicate that your time has expired. Hopefully we can get through both panels before we are interrupted for votes, and we will start with you, Ms. Broder. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Clay. Um, I'm Assistant Director, as you said, in the FTC's Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. The written testimony that we've submitted reflects the views of the Commission, but my oral remarks today are my own and don't necessarily reflect the views of the Commission or any Commissioner. Our written testimony details the approach the Commission has taken with respect to identity theft, our data security, education, and law enforcement program, our leadership in the President's Identity Theft Task Force, and our measures to improve consumer authentication. Right now, however, I want to focus on three specific areas. First, how the FTC helps consumers recover from identity theft. Second, remedies for identity theft victims. And to pull the mic closer and make sure it's, it's on. Okay, thanks. Is your microphone on? It push, press the button in front of Ah, is that better? There, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that told the clock. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I don't intend to, sir. Um, Almost 2 million consumers have turned to the Federal Trade Commission after they discovered that someone else has used their name to open up credit accounts, get a job, or even obtain health care. Among these victims, a soldier returning from Afghanistan, a mother calling on behalf of her disabled child whose identity was stolen, and people whose government benefits were terminated because someone else is working in their name. The FTC is the nation's one-stop shop for identity theft victims. We have a toll-free hotline that connects callers with trained counselors who, in English or Spanish, can walk the consumer through the steps of recovery. Online resources at ftc.gov slash ID theft provide the same types of assistance, explaining how to set fraud alerts with the credit reporting agencies, how to dispute fraudulent charges or accounts, and how to handle debt collectors. Last year alone, we helped more than 300,000 consumers who were victims of identity theft. In turn, their complaints are entered into our Consumer Sentinel Network, which is an online resource for law enforcers with direct access to these 2 million complaints and other useful investigative resources. Other organizations, including ITAC that you'll be hearing from later, also contribute data to Consumer Sentinel. This robust database is the nation's clearinghouse of identity theft complaints, and it's an essential tool for all investigative agencies that are investigating or prosecuting identity crimes. The FTC also is responsible for victims. For example, victims often need police reports in order to vindicate their good name, but many law enforcement agencies are overtaxed. They don't have sufficient resources to develop the kind of detailed police report that's necessary for recovery. The FTC identified this issue as a priority. So now when consumers file complaints with the FTC, law enforcers, over 1,700 agencies who have access to Consumer Sentinel can pull up that consumer's complaint, validate it as an identity theft report, 
a police report. So now the consumer has their police report. The police uh, agency is able to greatly simplify this task for all involved. We've also worked closely with the IRS, which has recently set up a dedicated helpline for victims of tax-related identity theft. We're launching a system to get callers connected to the specialized office of the IRS to resolve what are often very complex issues dealing with tax refunds or outstanding liability resulting from identity theft. And commission staff coordinate with other organizations that can provide more individualized help when that's what's needed. For example, the Identity Theft Resource Center, which also is testifying today, is the recipient of a Department of Justice grant to establish a model nationwide victim assistance program. Our call center has implemented implemented a system to direct people to that office. The FTC also is collaborating with the American Bar Association to establish a program to provide pro bono assistance to victims of identity theft. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss some new remedies for identity theft victims. The FACT Act, which was passed in 2003, provided important tools for victims of identity theft. We're now all entitled to a free copy of our credit report every 12 months from each of the credit reporting agencies. A credit report can offer an early warning sign of identity theft or that fraud is afoot. The FACT Act also allows identity theft victims to block fraudulent items and trade lines on their credit reports. They can place fraud alerts on their credit reports and obtain documents relating to the fraud, such as a fraudulent application. This last right is particularly important because many victims used to find themselves in a catch-22 where they would be receiving dunning notices for these fraudulently opened accounts but were denied access to the forged application because it was submitted by another person. This provision of the FACT Act addresses the frustrating scenario. Credit freezes, identity theft passports, and other tools also help prevent identity thieves from exploiting consumers' good names. Finally now, I'd like to mention the FTC's legislative recommendations that address identity theft. We have come a long way in building systems and processes to help identity theft victims, but clearly more needs to be done. The FTC is not a criminal enforcement agency, so we cannot prosecute the crime. Our partners at the Department of Justice are working aggressively on that front. Strong data security Locking down the data that identity thieves target is essential if we are to reduce the overall incidence of the crime. That is where we can exert our law enforcement muscle in areas that have direct impact on identity theft. Although the FTC has maintained a vigorous presence, bringing cases against companies that failed to use reasonable procedures to protect sensitive consumer information, we could have an even greater impact if the Commission could assess civil penalties for such violations. The Commission also has called for nationwide data security standards for those entities that are not already subject to such laws, as well as a national breach notification law. And finally, the Commission has recommended improved consumer authentication, as well as restrictions on the display and transmission of social security numbers, as part of a comprehensive approach to reducing the use of social security numbers in the Commission of Identity Theft. Chairman Clay, members of the committee, victims of identity theft often suffer harms that can endure for years. Although there now are more effective tools to respond to this crime, victims still face challenges in putting their lives back together. The FTC remains committed to working with victims. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Browder, for your testimony. Mr. Weinstein. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry. Thank you for your invitation to address the subcommittee this afternoon. As you know, identity theft affects millions of Americans every year and inflicts significant monetary and other harms upon its victims. Identity theft is by no means a new problem, but the methods used to commit this crime are evolving. While many criminals continue to use a variety of low-tech means to unlawfully acquire the personal information of others, in recent years, identity thieves have begun to use a variety of new technologies and new methods to access and exploit such information. As both individuals and businesses increasingly rely on computers and information technology to store, process, and share confidential personal information, opportunities have increased for criminals to exploit advances in information technology to hack into the computers that store this information. Cybercrime, once the province of the lone hacker, is now big business, and a growing number of potential victims are vulnerable. But as criminals have adapted to take advantage of new opportunities and data made available through networks and the Internet, Law enforcement has adapted as well. The Department of Justice, along with our law enforcement partners, 
has been aggressively investigating and prosecuting crimes that facilitate or constitute identity theft with tremendous success. Our benchmark prosecutions of large-scale data breaches and the identity theft that results from those breaches highlight the range of our efforts to address this growing problem. For example, most recently in late 2008, the FBI announced the results of a two-year undercover operation targeting members of the online carding forum known as Dark Market. At its peak, the Dark Market website had over 2,500 registered members around the world. The operation resulted in nearly 60 arrests worldwide and prevented an estimated $70 million in economic loss. In August of 2008, the Department and the U.S. Secret Service announced the largest hacking and identity theft case ever prosecuted, in which charges were brought in three districts against 11 members of an international hacking ring. The defendants who uh, hailed from the United States, Estonia, Ukraine, the People's Republic of China, and Belarus were charged with, among other things, the theft and sale of more than 40 million credit and debit card numbers obtained from various retailers. In 2004, in Operation Firewall, the U.S. Secret Service and several components of the Department of Justice coordinated the search and arrest of more than 28 members of the Shadow Crew criminal organization who were located in eight states here in the U.S. and in six foreign countries. Members of that group were later charged in a 62-count indictment with trafficking in at least 1.5 million stolen bank and credit card numbers that resulted in losses in excess of $4 million. As a result of that case, the Shadow Crew website was uh, disabled, which we believe prevented hundreds of millions of dollars in additional losses. And to date, with the exception of two fugitives, all of the domestic Shadow Crew defendants have pleaded guilty and received sentences of up to 90 months in prison. And Operation Firewall was one of our early efforts that paved the way for some of the more recent successes I mentioned and that are outlined in my written testimony. Uh, these cases that I've discussed and the others discussed in the written testimony illustrate the scope of the Department's efforts to combat the growing identity theft problem. But notably, they also reveal the global reach that cyber criminals can have. The identity thieves and the cyber criminals responsible for many of these and other large-scale data breaches live in and operate from foreign jurisdictions. Because of the global nature of the Internet, and the identity theft-related crimes it can, it can facilitate, continued close coordination and cooperation with foreign law enforcement is critical to the success of our identity theft investigations and prosecutions here at home. Now, in addition to our efforts to investigate and prosecute identity theft, we are also committed to continuing to work in coordination with other agencies to aid the victims of this serious crime through grants, such as uh, grants to the Identity Theft Resource Center and other agencies, uh, training, and other victim assistance programs. Now, while the Department is proud of these cases and of all of our efforts to tackle the growing and evolving identity theft problem, we recognize that there is much more to be done and we will continue to work with our law enforcement and private sector partners to meet that challenge. Our continued success is dependent on our ability to, number one, build upon the United States' existing relationships with international partners to strengthen law enforcement cooperation channels internationally, and number two, to explore legislation that can strengthen the penalties for stealing identity information and other related cyber crimes and that would require security breach reports to federal law enforcement so that we may pursue the criminals responsible for these acts as quickly and vigorously as possible. This, of course, is just a brief overview of the Department's role in combating these crimes and the primary issues we must focus on as we press ahead. We're very glad to have the opportunity this afternoon to discuss these issues with you further, and at the appropriate time, I'd be pleased to answer questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Weinstein. Uh, Mr. Bertoni, you recognize for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, good afternoon. I'm pleased to be here to discuss the role that personally identifiable information plays in identity theft. Such information, including one's name, date of birth, and SSN, is key to carrying out so many activities of daily life. However, this information is also valuable to persons seeking to commit fraud or identity theft. Advances in information technology have made it easier to collect and share sensitive information, but also resulted in more incidents of loss and unauthorized use. My remarks today focus on three areas, why we should be concerned about identity theft, actions taken at the federal, state, and local levels, and continuing challenges to protecting sensitive information. In summary, identity theft affects 10 million persons annually, translating into reported losses of $50 billion. Victims are often unaware that the crime has taken place until much harm has been done to their credit rating and can face substantial costs and inconvenience repairing the damage. Others have lost jobs, been refused loans or even arrested for crimes they didn't commit. During the course of our work, we have documented real-life examples of identity theft, both domestic and international. 
including the 2006 case of an Ohio woman who led a group of identity thieves in stealing information from public record keeper websites, resulting in $450 million in losses. In the 2007 case of an individual who partnered with thieves from Russia and Romania in an online phishing scam and com compromised over 4,000 credit card accounts and obtained full identity information for over 1,600 victims. Various laws and actions at the federal, state, and local level aim to deter identity theft. At the federal level, the Privacy Act of 1974 and the E-Government Act of 2002 define agencies' responsibilities for protecting personal information. Moreover, the Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002 requires agencies to develop programs for securing sensitive data in information systems. Over the last several years, the Office of Management and Budget has also issued numerous directives requiring agencies to, to have to put in additional steps for safeguarding personal information, including establishing senior privacy officers and developing data breach notification plans. States and localities have also acted to prevent identity theft and assist victims. More states now recognize identity theft and related activities as a crime, while many others have incorporated victim assistance provisions into their laws, such as credit or security freezes. And some county governments have also begun removing or truncating dis SSNs displayed in their public records. Despite these actions, vulnerabilities persist in three critical areas. First, issues related to the display and use of the SSN have not been sufficiently addressed. Because of its unique nature and broad applicability, the SSN has become the identifier of choice for both the public and private sectors. And unfortunately, unfortunately, millions of electronic public records contain SSNs that can be easily compromised due to the absence of a national standard for SSN truncation, that is the practice of blocking either the first five or last four digits of the number. To illustrate, within a matter of minutes, we easily reconstructed full nine-digit SSNs and other identity information for individuals in 10 states by combining various electronic records that use disparate truncation methods. We've recommended that the Congress establish a national truncation standard. Second, federal law does not cover all data or services provided by information resellers in other industries. Today, data resellers and their contractors electronically amass and share large amounts of personal information. However, no federal law explicitly requires them to safeguard all personal data, even when it is sensitive and subject to misuse by identity thieves. And we've recommended that the Congress strengthen requirements for information resellers and in other industries similar to those imposed on financial institutions. And lastly, federal agencies continue to experience security incidences that may expose sensitive information to identity thieves. Federal agencies rely heavily on automated systems and electronic data which must be protected against unauthorized use. We have made numerous recommendations to broadly strengthen the integrity of federal information systems and ultimately reduce breaches and other security incidents. However, continued breaches at various federal agencies and facilities, such as the National Archives, underscore the importance of vigilance in this area. We've noted that data breach notifications to affected parties can have clear benefits in terms of mitigating the impacts of identity theft and enhancing public accountability, and have recommended that OMB develop guidance to help agencies make risk-based decisions as to what services to offer individuals whose personal information has been compromised, and we will continue to monitor progress in this area. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bertoni. We have been joined by the ranking men, uh, member, uh, Mr. McHenry of North Carolina, and I will recognize him first uh, for five minutes of questioning. Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I was detained, but uh, I certainly appreciate your testimony. I've uh, taken a look at your testimony before. Um, but, uh, you know, it's obvious, you know, we, there is an identity theft challenge that we're facing as a country. Um, and Congress, in the House, we've got largely divided jurisdictions, and so we have a jurisdictional uh, committee issue on uh, this issue as well. Uh, in terms of really acting to, to preclude some of the uh, issues that you, you brought up today, I'm on financial services. We certainly have a substantial uh, amount of concern there with identity theft and, and how that has ramifications for people's credit ratings and and access to credit generally. Uh, Mr. Bertoni, you referenced a, a, a um, truncation standard. 
Now, you're talking about uh, to truncate uh, someone's Social Security number? Correct. Okay. Correct. Would that, is that difficult to do? Because what the federal government has said with the Social Security number is it, it, it's only for Social Security. It's not an identification uh, number. That's what we've stated in the law. Now, in fact, uh, you know, colleges, uh, uh, banks, um, you know, institutions large and small use, use your Social Security number uh, as basically your identifier. Um, will we have to change existing law there in order to acknowledge that it is, in fact, an identification number? No, we're taking questions. Um, the, the fact is that the SSN has been, become the unique national identifier. Um, SSA will uh, say that it is not uh, to be used for identification purposes, but let's face it, that's where we're at. You can't rent a movie from Blockbuster or, or get satellite television without providing your, your SSN, and that's being bumped against other data elements to confirm uh, identity. And um, in our view, the Social Security number is probably the most critical piece of information that identity, identity thieves would want. Uh, in, in terms of the personal identifying information that they can get their hands on. Without the SSN, the other elements are much more difficult to do anything with. Um, I don't believe you have to do anything to change the law. We've, uh, Graham Leach Bliley has already uh, determined or made uh, in, uh, codified that the SSN is part of personal identifying information that sure. uh, can confirm and can identity and needs to be protected. So it's a matter of um, taking some next steps to broaden that to, I think, some other industries. And as far as truncation goes, it's not difficult. It's a matter of getting, on a national level, the standard to be consistent. Because if you're truncated on the front half and an information another information reseller is truncated on the back end, within minutes I can find both sides of that SSN and probably find your name, date of birth, and some other records and have an identity very quickly. Certainly. Um, and. and Speaking of Social Security numbers, and, and you're, you mentioned the National Archives, the loss of information or theft of information. We're uh, not certain of even now what exactly happened. Uh, but the, the hard drive disappearance at the National Archives, uh, it included 100,000 Social Security numbers, including apparently Al Gore's daughter's Social Security number is, is, on, is in this information, and contact information, including addresses uh, for various and high-ranking Clinton administration officials, Secret Service law, uh, as well as Secret Service, and, and uh, a number of other personnel that are included. Um, this is highly sensitive information, right? So, uh, you know, and I'm not asking you to testify about the procedures at the National Archives, but what can the government do to mitigate the damage or potential damage of this loss of information? I think right up front, um, some thought to encryption should have been at, in play. If you have encrypted data, mm -hmm. uh, you leave it in somewhere where it shouldn't be, it's going to be much more difficult for an identity thief to do something with, especially if it's, up, it's uh, encrypted uh, uh, in accordance with NIST standards. Um, so on the front end, I don't know what that data looked like, but I would hope, or I, I don't know, it, it had some type of enc encryption technology. After the fact, we now have to do a risk-based assessment of where do we think this ended up, what was on it, and what's the likelihood of uh, identity theft. And from there, you go to uh, a go, no go on data breach notification, then ultimately uh, another risk assessment uh, assessing what's the likelihood of, that this is out there and being used and then beyond that um, you have to think about what services you're going to you're going to offer passive monitoring or active alerts on credit records or you know even credit freezes so there's some major decisions that have to be made after the fact mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments uh, ms broder um, yes um, briefly uh, the social security number is indeed a very sensitive and valuable piece of identity for identity thieves, but partly that's because um, it's used not only as an identifier to link you with your information, but also as an authenticator to establish that you are indeed the person who you purport to be. And one of the recommendations that the Federal Trade Commission has made was that companies that open up consumer accounts have more rigorous standards to authenticate consumers. So it's not so easy, so that the social security number is not 
the de facto key to the kingdom, but that more robust systems are in place to prevent that type of fraud from happening. And um, of course, other recommendations, certainly locking down social security numbers, having appropriate data security are important front end, but uh, authentication also could go a long way to reducing the incidence of identity theft. Mm -hmm. Schweinstein, any comments? No. Wow. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I know we have other questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, Ms. Broder, uh, ID breaches are very devastating to consumers involved uh, and oftentimes are caused by simple negligence uh, by businesses or their refusal to make any attempts at compliance uh, with privacy policies. Uh, I noted in your statement that the FTC has since 2001 used this authority under the FTC Act uh, to bring 26 cases against businesses uh, that allegedly failed to protect consumers' personal information. And uh, can you give me examples of the types of punishment uh, that is given to these businesses that disregard those safeguards designed to protect privacy? Are they, are they sufficient as deterrents? Are they too soft? Uh, does the uh, FTC Act need strengthening? Um, one of our recommendations is that we can now bring cases, data security cases, under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, under the graham leach Bliley Act, um, but we can't seek civil penalties. Those laws do not give us the authority to impose civil penalties against those companies. So while we can get injunctive relief that requires them to subject themselves to audits, that um, requires them to take certain steps to improve their data security program, at this present time, sir, we cannot um, assess civil penalties. That is one of the legislative recommendations that the uh, Commission has made because we think a financial deterrent would go a long way to encouraging greater compliance with these laws. You, you mentioned um, a, a grant for a nationwide model uh, for relief for victims. Have you come up with a nationwide model? The Department of Justice's Office of Victims of Crime have given grants to four different organizations around the country to develop um, nonprofit centers for victims of identity theft that can provide greater assistance, more um, individualized care for people who have more engaged problems. What we find at the FTC of the 300,000 people who contacted us last year seeking assistance, many of them are able to use these tools themselves to restore their credit history, to dispute fraudulent accounts. There are tools in place, and many consumers are able to exercise them. In more complex problems or with consumers who are not able to exercise those rights, we find that those organizations often can provide additional assistance. Thank so the FTC is okay. kind of doing a lot of work there every day, 20,000 contacts every week from consumers asking for information or seeking advice on identity theft. But there are some cases that are more complex that need more time. That grant is still underway, and I think a final assessment has not yet been made on the success okay. of those we, programs. We would be interested in seeing what the assessments are. Uh, Mr. Weinstein, um, you know, ID theft is on the rise. Uh, what are some of the new or emerging forms of the crime? You know, the crime varies from low tech to high tech. Uh, there are still uh, plenty of ident identity uh, thieves who use low tech uh, means to get uh, personal identifying information and then to exploit it using a telephone. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and their own uh, personal skill at dealing with people. But the high-tech trend, um, I think the most troubling is, the, is the, the carding forum. And a carding forum is an online active marketplace for the sale and exploitation of, uh, of technology and, and tools to commit intrusions and to, um, to, to buy and sell the data from those intrusions. Um, a number of the cases that are our division and U.S. attorneys' offices nationwide have been prosecuting, investigating and prosecuting that have been the most challenging have involved carding forums. And they're challenging on a number of levels. First, they, uh, they have numerous members. The dark market, when I, I mentioned, had 2,500 active members at one time. Second, those members are worldwide. And so they present a lot of the challenges that any international case presents. 
But those, uh, what makes those uh, such disturbing tr uh, trends um, in identity theft is that they are so sophisticated and they are so organized. Um, uh, as I said in my statement, identity th uh, thieves used to be solo actors. Um, now identity thieves are, are often linked with organized crime. And we find that organized crime, especially international organized uh, criminal organizations, are capitalizing on the value uh, of personal identifying information and exploiting that to make lots of money very quickly. Um, if you go onto one of these carding forums, if you are vouched for and you're able to get access to it, or, or as we do, uh, if an undercover officer is able to get access, um, your mind will be blown by what is going on on these sites. Um, stolen uh, credit card and ATM information that has been obtained through computer intrusions is there for sale. Um, people who can commit hacking and other types of intrusions are offering their services for money. Um, uh, false identification documents, uh, fraudulent credit cards that have been manufactured using information that's stolen are being offered for sale. Tools and equipment to manufacture fraudulent credit cards are being offered for sale. Um, and that information is exploited for, uh, uh, to make massive amounts of money, to steal massive amounts of money in a short period of time. So that, I think, is the most difficult uh, trend in, in, um, in high-tech identity theft, and that's the one that we're most concerned about. What, uh, what type of legislation could we enact that would reduce the threat of identity theft? Have you come up with any good, good ideas or suggestions? Well, there's two, legislation in, in two areas that I think would be useful and that would make what we're already doing more effective. Um, we work very hard to keep pace with the increasingly sophisticated criminals we investigate and prosecute. Um, uh, we continually train investigators and agents. We have um, uh, the highest tech tools and, and, and the best trained investigators and prosecutors anywhere in pursuing these type of crime, uh, this type of crime. And we uh, try to keep pace with and anticipate what the cyber criminals will do next. But there are two areas in, in the law that I think um, even after the uh, Identity Theft Enforcement and Restitution Act of 2008 that, uh, that are areas where we can still improve uh, our efforts. Number one, uh, legislation that will enable us to better coordinate and cooperate with our international partners. As the examples I gave in my statement and the others that are mentioned in the written testimony indicate, this is increasingly an international crime, a transnational crime. And as I indicated a moment ago, the, because this crime is increasingly committed by or uh, participated in by international criminal organizations, it is absolutely essential that we be able to, to work cooperatively with foreign law enforcement. And cooperation with foreign law enforcement is a two-way street. Every day we ask foreign governments and foreign law enforcement agencies to help us in prosecutions that we're, we're, we're uh, engaging in over here. But they need our help as well. Uh, and, uh, and so legislation that clarifies the authority of U.S. courts to compel the production of evidence that can be used in a foreign criminal investigation, something, by the way, that was one of the recommendations in the Identity Theft Task Force a few years ago, but that hasn't made it into law yet, would be a, a very effective tool uh, because the more we can offer help to our foreign partners who are fully engaged on this issue, the more we can expect them to help us. So that's num number one. Number two uh, is closer to home, and that's um, sentencing. Uh, the uh, Congress in the Identity Theft Enforcement and Restitution Act directed the Sentencing Commission to examine the guidelines related to identity theft and to, uh, and to explore amendments to them. And, and the Sentencing Commission uh, has come up with some amendments to the uh, guidelines that govern identity theft, but those amendments, I think, are lacking. Um, as these criminals become more sophisticated using proxies, uh, using keystroke loggers and, and spyware, um, using increasing, uh, increasingly sophisticated technology to exploit our personal information, we need the sentencing schemes to keep up. And so uh, we believe that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is codified at Title 18 U.S. Code Section 1030, which is the statute that we principally charge in this area uh, for computer-related identity, th identity theft, should be amended to, for, to, uh, to adopt harsher penalties for this kind of crime, and that the guidelines should be amended accordingly um, for even uh, greater enhancements for the use of sophisticated technologies. Um, identity theft involving high-tech means is harder to investigate and it's harder to prosecute. It's much more resource intensive and it's much more dangerous because using high technology, identity thieves can get more people's information and, more mo and, and use it to steal more money in a shorter period of time. Um, the guidelines should punish that kind of identity theft involving that kind of technology and those kinds of means much more harshly uh, than, than other forms of, of this crime. And so we think that the guidelines should be amended as well to, to keep pace with the, uh, with the increasingly sophisticated technology and, and techniques that our criminals are using. Thank you for that response. I'll, I'll go to my, our colleague from Ohio, Mr. Driehaus, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for holding 
the, this panel and, and the next panel. I, I think this is a critically important issue. As, as a state legislator in Ohio for eight years, uh, we often wrestled with the issue of identity theft. And I recall uh, one of my colleagues in the legislature calling me one time and reciting to me my Social Security number that he found on a local government website because I had gotten a traffic ticket and uh, the clerk of courts in his infinite wisdom decided that all records not only are public but should be published uh, on the internet. And, and so we, we worked to, to modify that in the state of Ohio, but I gotta tell you, it took a long time uh, to make that happen. So I, I'm interested in, in the perspective of uh, all of you really, all three of you, uh, as to what we can do at the congressional level to, this always happens when I'm, uh, I'm asking questions, by the way, um, but to what we might be able to do to provide guidance to state and local governments, because they continue to have this problem, this quandary, um, between making information available to the public and protecting the privacy of the citizens of their various jurisdictions. And you find that the policies are all over the place. And in the case of Hamilton County, where I am in Cincinnati, the clerk of courts was simply um, taking documents, scanning documents, and putting them directly onto the internet, despite, despite the fact that they had, they had information about people's bank accounts, they had social security numbers, they had private information, they weren't redacting the information. His excuse was that they couldn't redact the information because it was documents being scanned, which I found to be kind of lame. But, but I would like your input as, as to how we might do a better job in informing policy at the state and local level so that those local entities aren't making this information available because we see this happen all the time. I could take a shot at that. Um, before you uh, came in, I had a lot to say about uh, public record keepers. Um, I, I think one thing we have here, you know, issues of federalism in state rights, certainly. Um, but, but I do believe uh, through the years and, and opportunities that we've had to look at this that states are becoming more aware of the value of SSN and other personally identifiable information in public records. So we, see, we do see movement in, in, in many cases of states trying to at least truncate or redact SSNs. Uh, Florida wholesale has redacted SSNs from their records. But there is variability. One thing that we've tried to do or have perhaps suggest is perhaps the Association of Governors can come together and talk about best practices for redaction and truncation. Um, but, you know, that's going to take some, some cooperation across states. As far as uh, guidance, um, I think there is, um, there, there are good things happening out there that states are doing. It's a matter of um, level, raising it up to the level of a national level where we can have a form. And we've done that in, in various forms and testifying about what states are doing. But, but given the number of entities, that state and local governments that are out there, there, there doesn't tend to be any uniformity. And, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. How do we bring uniformity to the practices at the local level in terms of the availability of documents? You know, they're dealing with their own state's sunshine laws and what records need to be made available. But how do we get to a point where there's uniformity at the state and local government level in terms of the information being made available? I don't know if we're going to be able to, you're going to be able to um, direct states to um, either include or, or, or not include information. I mean, you know, I'm not getting, we're getting into issues of federalism, state rights. But um, we believe there is opportunity to um, uh, establish at the congressional level a national standard for truncation. So at least what's in there uh, will be consistent in terms of how uh, SSNs are, are truncated in, in uh, either the front end or back end. Because right now, um, it's very easy to go into any single state set of records and find, um, because of varying variance in, in truncation, the front end and the back end of the SSN and put your identity together very quickly. So at step one, we've, we have recommended that the Congress establish, establish a national truncation standard. Um, Mr. Driehaus, we actually submitted uh, testimony to the Ohio committee that was addressing this very issue about public access to data and social security numbers. And it is a challenging one, as Mr. Bertoni set out. Uh, there are some models going forward. Certainly the federal court system and the bankruptcy court system have undertaken a system to truncate from their records social security number and other uh, personally identifying information for which there's no public value in revealing 
of course, we have a, a public interest in making, giving transparency to process, but there's a point at which some of this information does not serve that purpose. And so in the federal court electronic system, none of this data um, is readily available. But there are many people who say that um, with respect to for example, the social security number, the cost associated with doing this process retroactively is overwhelming. Going through all of the records, all of the housing records and anything else that may now be available electronically, it is um, a very costly undertaking. In other words, maybe the feathers are already out of the pillow, can't put them back in. And then I would return um, to the issue of authentication. If companies took better care in making sure that they were dealing with the right person rather than just seeing a social security number and assuming that was adequate for opening an account, then the availability of this information would be much less of a threat. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be protected, but um, this is all part of a comprehensive program to protect the data, make it less available, but also less useful for identity thieves. If, if I could add to that. Um you're right. I think uh, in the case of Ohio, uh, t they sell public records to in, in bulk to various vendors. So even if you were to start redacting or removing or truncating today, th those records have been sold and resold and resold uh, already many, many times. So um, going forward, you could, you could sort of stop the, this flow of SSNs into public records. But re keep in mind, this information has already been sold to many vendors. And that's where we get at the other piece of, of our other recommendations that regardless of industry, you have to look at the sensitivity of the information and, and, and mandate that that information be controlled regardless of who you are and what, and what you're using it for. Information resellers, tax preparations, uh, telecommunications, all those right now are, are held to a lower bar in terms of uh, information disclosure and protection. Thank you, Mr. Treehouse. Uh, Bertoni, uh, are there currently any plausible alternatives to the Social Security number as a personal identifier uh, in government systems? I don't think any widely plausible alternatives currently exist. Um, again, this started in 1935 with an executive order that all federal agencies are going to use the SSN for internal and external management of their programs. So this is long-standing ingrained use, usage. Um, I do know that there are alternatives being considered, at least on a case-by-case -case basis. The health industry is starting to uh, move away from the Social Security number as your identifier and assigning alternative uh, uh, patient numbers. The Office of Management and Budget in 2007 directed agencies to look for alternatives uh, to the SSN in uh, assigning numbers to, to uh, personnel for either travel management or payroll, et cetera, et cetera. And even in GAO, we've, we've gone in that direction. We have alternatives to the SSN. But as far as a broadly used national uh, uh, number, uh, no. And if we go in that direction, we are in the same position that we have to, from day one, think about how we would protect it. Yeah, d does any single federal agency have the authority to regulate the use of the Social Security number in federal information systems? Not that I'm aware of. Um, originally, uh, many had uh, argued that SSA, SSA would, would be the one that would do that, but their view is that their regulation stops uh, once it leaves the agency. So within the agency, they, they regulate and control. Once it goes to another federal agency, they do not believe they have jurisdiction to tell that other agency what to do with the number. Okay. Uh, anyone else on the panel have anything to add? If not, let me, uh, we will dismiss this, this panel um, and then go into recess for uh, two votes on the floor and when we come back, swear in the second panel. Uh, and members are reminded that you have up to five legislative days to submit opening statements or any other materials for the record. And Mr. McHenry, your opening statement will be included without objection. Uh, we stand in recess.